Hello, and thank you so much to James, Matt, and the team at Business Green for having us. And a very warm welcome to you all uh, to this workshop where we are going to spend an hour in the shoes of a delegate on one of our executive education programs at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, grappling with some of the biggest questions that we face uh, as a society, such as that of our title slide, what is your unique contribution as a leader to de deliver the sustainable lives in a world of 9 billion people. So I'm going to set the stage with some context about how we support senior leaders to uh, in the successful management of change. But what better way I thought of explaining what we do than experiencing it. So I am joined by three incredible speakers who are also members of our, BS, our Global Steering Committee to give you a taste of the types of provocations and constructive challenge that we share during our seminars. And this is the programme we're showcasing specifically the Prince of Wales's Business and Sustainability Programme, one of the world's longest standing sustainability programmes founded 27 years ago by our patron, the Prince of Wales. The programme has, of course, evolved dramatically over the last 27 years, but uh, one thing has endured, and that is our mission to develop the capabilities and knowledge of senior leaders to influence meaningful change, not incremental change, but meaningful change at the scale required to deliver a sustainable economy. So we've amassed a large and growing network of individuals over the years, and seminars take place under normal circumstances six times a year, twice in Cambridge, also in Cape Town, Melbourne, online. And today we are launching our event, which is taking place for the first time in April 2022 in beautiful Singapore. So the mission at CISL, from, from right to left of this slide here, we believe that to achieve the, the, the sustainable development goals, which I see as our best shot of a master plan for humanity, Change must occur at three levels, transforming the economic system, which has led us to where we are today. I'll go into a bit more detail shortly. And recognizing that business has been part of the problem and business can also, and is increasingly being expected to be part of the solution. But to be part of the solution, business much must change. And that's going to take incredible leadership from the executives within businesses. And that's why we target the top level of organizations those that really have a responsibility for shaping the purpose of the business and, of course, the strategy. So the, the sustainability should be at the absolute core and the centre of the business strategy. And we do this in a number of ways within the Prince of Wales' Business and Sustainability Programme. And I call this, this is the U theory, I call it rather probably sadistically, the painful process of unlearning, of letting go of uh, what you think you know and really just emptying your cup of knowledge and repopulating it with the latest science-based information to really understand the global system's pressures and trends. Then filtering that through to what that means for the business context, how's that showing up in the operating context for business in terms of risks and opportunities, and then finding those points of leverage to influence that context as opposed to waiting for it to happen to you as a business leader. We do use case studies as a provocation of what business transformation um, can look like. However, right now, more than ever, the ground is fertile for innovation. So we use the case studies as examples to increase the level of ambition within delegations, but we really do encourage people to find their own path. And then ultimately, at the end, we deploy. So we talk about the leadership required for the future we want, how this differs from traditional leadership, and ultimately to deploy inspired and energized leaders with a heightened level of ambition and sense of purpose. So just briefly, uh, these are some of the ways we achieve change practically in our programs. We don't rush to find solutions to very complicated problems. We take a step back and uh, one of the hallmarks of the Prince of Wales problem is our ability to think systemically. So the interconnected nature of our global challenges. The SDGs isn't a pick and mix, they have to be delivered in full. So we really make those connections between the challenges that we face. We operate as a delegation under Chatham House rule. So we don't ascribe any comments to an individual or group. That really just helps us speak much more freely and constructively challenge each other. These are delegations of 45 senior leaders from a range of sectors. So um, it's, it's really important to, to have a safe space to, to explore, to innovate, which I've mentioned, 
also to engage in dialogue. Um, and another hallmark of the program is peer learning. So uh, people come to Cambridge expecting a lot of the answers from the front of the room. Um, and I would say a lot do come from kind of ideas sparked within the delegation from learning across sectors. A uh, huge number of ideas actually come from the pub, of course. And acting differently, I think the definition of insanity is doing the same things again and again and expecting different outcomes. We really ask delegates to commit to doing things differently and describing what that will look like when they get back to their day job the following week. And just to point in our approach, it's not just transmission, standing and talking. There's a lot of interactivity as well. There's breakout groups, syndicates, we take people to, on field trips, and it's just an opportunity to really um, kind of create a more collaborative atmosphere uh, where people can proactively and interactively learn. Now, before I introduce my first speaker, I'm going to set the side and we're going back to basics. You'll be delighted to hear and back to business school, actually. So anyone who went to business school will recognize Porter's five forces. And this is the framework for analyzing the environment, which ensures the long term commercial success of a business. This is from the 70s and um, from Harvard University. But John Harvard actually went to Cambridge. So I think we can claim that one for ourselves. And amazingly, this still stands true all these years later in terms of how a company creates commercial value. However, uh, this is kind of the wider context that the company is increasingly having to consider. A thriving society, a healthy environment and a strong economy are all factors that need to underpin a commercially successful company. The view that we have, however, is this. We are increasingly and uh, consistently liquidating those vital underpinning environmental and social assets to feed the one thing that we're really, really good at measuring, and that's economics. So to grow the economy, we are um, acting in a way that is eroding the social and the environmental fabric that we depend on for thriving companies to act in the long term and successfully. And this is showing up in terms of environmental and social pressures at the absolute core of businesses. And many of you from businesses will recognize this, whether this is increasingly intense weather events disrupting supply chains or consumer activism really applying pressure to business to act and do things very differently. And I'm going to pose the first dilemma of the day. And that is that we cannot continue to grow this way. I think that's universally recognizable that this type of growth is unsustainable, but just stop growing is not an alternative. Zero growth is unstable. That can create incredible societal unrest, particularly for those individuals who did not benefit from the traditional economy, which is a huge, huge swathe of the global population. And this is kind of a stylized version of that. If you're interested in this as a model, I encourage you to see our rewiring economy report. That's kind of our strategy at CISL in terms of how we think what we need to do with the economy to deliver on the sustainable development goals. So now to our speakers. So this valiant group of people usually have several hours to present the information uh, that they're going to show you today. I've given them 12 minutes, so I'm making no friends during this, this workshop. So we're going to invite, first of all, Tony, who is a campaigner, uh, an, an expert in nature, author, and general spokesperson for Planet Earth with a long, uh, long career in Friends of the Earth, WWF, and now as the chair of Natural England. I'll then ask Tony to pass to Anna, who is our passionate advocate for digital technologies and their incredibly powerful ability to enact change at the heart of that social part of our circle in particular. Mm -hmm. And then over to Alan, who is our straight shooting businessman um, with a career across a range of companies, Virgin Group, SAB Miller, B&Q, ArcelorMittal, and most recently, the energy generation company, Drax. So without further ado, Tony, can you please share with us what the hell's going on in the world? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alice, and, and good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a, a, a net zero festival, and so people are coming with an interest in climate change. And of course, that's exactly what happens at the Business and Sustainability Programme with CISL. Many of our delegates come believing that the principal challenge we have is rapid decarbonisation. And of course, that very much is the case. However, there are a wide range of other factors that we also need to be having in mind. 
And there are a range of pressures, of course, that lie behind the observation of changing atmospheric composition. Uh, we've gone very rapidly uh, in the early 19th century from a population of 1 billion to today where we're approaching a global population of 8 billion. And that rapid increase in demand arising from so many more people uh, joining the global human population, it's being accelerated by an even more rapid uh, increase in the size of the global economy and indeed since 1950 the population has tripled but since then the size of the economy has grown tenfold. That is, has in large part been driven uh, by rapid urbanization, which in turn has relied on vast quantities of cheap energy, mostly coming from fossil sources, and of course, uh, a huge increase in global food production. And on top of that, uh, there has been a rapid increase in demand for fresh water. All of these things uh, are seen in uh, the parallel rise in the demand for other natural resources, wood, uh, for metals, minerals, and then to lead to this increasing change in the atmosphere. The point there being that this is linked back to not only uh, the use of fossil fuels, but a wide range of other pressures. And of course, on top of the widely discussed uh, change in the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere is the parallel mass extinction of species which is taking place, which is beginning to gather some profile now, but which has huge implications uh, in terms of the changing relationship with the natural world feeding back into trends in the human world. You can start to see some of these things uh, through uh, particular cases of, of things that are happening on the ground. Um, this week, uh, we launched Sat Landsat 9, uh, the ninth of a series of satellites that have been gathering data from high above planet Earth now for about 50 years, enabling us to piece together sequences of images like this. See the road going into the Western Amazon in the early 1980s, followed by rapid deforestation. This is being driven by global demand for food. This is soya beans and the uh, production of beef feeding global markets. It's being driven by the movement of populations from the poor northeast of Brazil being deliberately resettled uh, into areas of remote forest, a big social uh, dimension to this. And it's being driven by global demand for minerals and for wood. And those underlying pressures which are causing this rapid ecological shift uh, are in turn then leading to big global uh, pressures. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions, billions of tons of carbon has been released and is being released by deforestation. The destruction of the tropical forests is the big, biggest single reason for the mass extinction of animals and plants. And these rainforests are not called rainforests for nothing. They're pumping billions of tons of water into the atmosphere that's traveling as far as South Africa and North America from the Amazon basin, thereby sustaining food security in world, some of the world's most productive land. So this is a multiplicity of issues uh, encapsulated in the pictures you can see there of one trend, namely tropical deforestation. And the global picture we can see unfolding uh, next to these kinds of specific cases that we sometimes focus upon is the global average temperature per month uh, going back to the 1870s. And you can see the changing average going towards the 1.5 degree threshold that is now so often spoken about following the Paris Accord and which remains a very important subject as we approach COP. 26. But rarely do we have this placed in the context of the interconnected pressures that are now feeding into the human world. Sometimes this is seen as an environmental issue. Well, we're increasingly seeing that it's actually much more than that as we start to understand some of the economic consequences that lie behind some of these pressures and the interconnected nature of them. One that's been talked about um, for some years now is the so-called energy, food and water nexus. This diagram just gives us a little sense of how some of these connections work. Uh, and one, of course, that's very much in the news at the moment is the relationship between fossil resources being used to make fertilizer, which is then feeding back in a surprising way into the food industry uh, when we realize how the impact 
arising from gas prices has changed the economics of nitrogen fertilizer production, meaning that a carbon dioxide byproduct that was being used to stun animals and abattoirs is no longer available because that particular industry has been knocked off course by changing uh, prices in the gas sector. So the web of connections as we experience change in the real world becomes ever more surprising and ever more profound. And of course, as we see the effects of drought hitting the uh, the food sector and the impacts of drought hitting the energy sector. So we're reminded of the deep vulnerabilities that now exist in the human world as we find our lack of resilience being exposed through the way in which we've previously ne neglected these interconnected uh, questions. And perhaps the grandfather of all of the big surprises that we've had during recent times is seen in the effects of the pandemic, which has caused a multi-trillion dollar impact on the global economy, but which is very much related to our collective relationship with the natural world. In this case, uh, it is believed that the mixing of wild caught bats for food alongside illegally traded pangolins being captured for uh, medicinal and other purposes mixed in cages in highly stressful conditions enable the coronavirus to move from the bats into the pangolins into the human population leading to what we've been living through during recent times and a reminder down the bottom there on the right uh, that this is not the only pandemic that has been caused by an imbalance between the relationship uh, of nature and people. And down the bottom there, you see the uh, consequences of the bushmeat trade, the capture of great apes for sale uh, in different markets. That's how the AIDS virus got into the human population. And up the top there, a picture of deforestation reminding us of the origins of Ebola. But SARS, MERS, Nipah virus, uh, and indeed 70% of the zoonotic viruses that have jumped uh, into the human world uh, in recent times have come from wild creatures. And this is something which of course poses a continuing, a continuing risk. And the more we deforest, the more we damage uh, the natural environment, then of course the bigger that risk becomes. And the profundity of the implications of this, of course, we're seeing in a whole range of social and economic impacts that have followed in the wake of the pandemic. But one thing I would observe is our propensity uh, very often uh, in the human world to react to crises rather well uh, in terms of lockdowns, face masks and vaccines. But how much have you heard in the news about the origins of the pandemic and the extent to which that risk is increasing day by day as we interfere with the natural cycles that sustain life on this planet. And of course, uh, climate change itself is another source of disease risk as the changing patterns of, of average temperatures in particular, and indeed moisture, uh, lead to pathogens being able to change their range, malaria being one very good case in point. So the system is fully interconnected and our failure to see these interconnections is leading to risks. And those risks are now playing out in the human world. And as Alice said a moment ago, uh, that the uh, society and economy really are inside an envelope of environmental uh, functions. And those environmental functions are being damaged and undermined and are now feeding back into the economic and social system. And the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, is one of the best examples we have of that during recent times. So having uh, laid out some of the basic uh, thinking as to why an interconnected set of problems uh, are leading to surprising and disruptive uh, impacts in the human world, uh, the question then is, what are we going to do about it? Well, one of the things we need to do about it is to take a more integrated view of the economy. And as Alice said again, uh, this is about economic transformation. The problem we've got is that the economy is lying outside the natural system and the assumptions that we've previously made about economics no longer hold true. And indeed, for many decades, we've taken the view as a, as a society that economic growth is a necessary driver of human improvement, well-being, job creation, able to bring people out of poverty. All of those things have been true up to a point, except for the fact that we've ignored 
the environmental and increasingly the social downsides of all of that. And now those feedbacks are starting to reveal the need for a different approach. That different approach um, has been expressed in different ways. And I give you one uh, way of looking at the challenge in terms of what we might do in the future in the form of this diagram, uh, which depicts the idea of donut economics. So the yellow circle you can see there is the zone of sustainable economic welfare. And around that zone of sustainable economic welfare, you can see uh, the ceiling of environmental uh, impacts that we can tolerate in relation to climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, land use change, and the need to reflect all of those, like 1.5 degrees, uh, in the way in which we conduct our economic activity. And then at the same time, recognizing that we have to uh, achieve a social foundation, otherwise this is going to be politically impossible. Income, uh, jobs, energy, health, all of those things that people need have to be provided at the same time as achieving that environmental ceiling. And indeed, the critical role of education uh, and recognizing, for example, there, the linkage back to population. If we do wish to limit population growth in the future, one of the things, by no means the only thing, but one of the things we will need to invest in is education for everybody, just to complete the loop uh, of uh, connections that started with that first slide. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we're going to need a different kind of leadership to go into this zone of economic uh, sustainability. And that kind of leadership is something we talk a lot about at CISL on the BSP. And we're now going to hear a few remarks from Anna about what leadership for this kind of shift might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Um, and as Tony has talked about the rapid, he's talked about the rapid increase in our global population and the associated explosion in demand on natural resources. And with increasing recognition of the impact of human on human of human environmental damage, government and business leaders are increasingly recognizing that the net zero transition is dependent on human and societal behavior change. But to change our behavior, we need to understand humans. And I think um, I've got to press a button here, agreement. I'm going to see if this works. Oh, this... Alice, do you want to see if you can move the slides? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so the world around us is changing. Go to the next one. We'll start. There's always yeah, a technical issue. Thank you very that. much. Yes, this is perfect. Try yours again. Uh, it might be able, you might be able to use your thing. Thank you very much. Okay. Density's business is built on data. So we own the world's largest data platform. And through that data, we generate insights. Insights to the world around us and how human beings are interacting with it. And that's really important to understand when we're looking at how we shift behavior at mass scale. COVID has forced us to reimagine everything from how we work to how freely we travel to our food and waste and to our attitudes towards each other. And of course, the events of 2020 have created huge tipping points. So the mass climate change protests spearheaded by the iconic Greta Thunberg we were seeing before the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement that erupted in response to George Floyd's senseless murder, the culture wars, and we've seen a lot of that in the UK in particular, cancel culture and the anti-woke backlash. And of course, the way that consumers rewarded or punished brands depending on their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And people's attitudes have changed dramatically as their lives have been disrupted. We are more aware of our borderless world and the fact that events in China can quickly escalate and impact not just our economy, but life as we know it. And as a result, consumers are re-evaluating. And as we stay at home and recycling efforts are impacted, people have full visibility of the waste they generate. Um, the latest handbag is no longer as important as it was. We value our freedom um, much more than everything. People are investing in their homes too. 
we still want to explore, but a lot of the data suggests that we want to do this closer to home. And I think we saw that, for example, in Cornwall um, over August with 250,000 people descending in one weekend. Um, so staycations have become very normal and we expect this trend to stay. Next slide. To, so today, people are no longer passive consumers. They've become activists, driven by a new range of influences and causes, from climate change to data privacy, and new definitions of identity. And it's clear that tomorrow's consumer will be motivated by causes and values in a profound way. We are seeing growing consumer impatience for action on climate change at a global level. Um, and we were with uh, Jesper Broden last week, in fact, who was talking about the recent research from IKEA and Globescan. Um, in their research, um, it was 70% of people feeling really very impatient and anxious about action on climate change. Most consumers believe that a company's reputation itself will be informed by its action on climate change mitigation by 2030. This is coming out very strongly in our data. Next slide. And food waste is high on the agenda, in particular in APAC, where there is a growing recognition of the inability of our current food system to meet the growing population. And as Tony talked about, you know, an explosion of demand for pure water um, and food, um, and at the same time as we recognize our food system is not scalable or sustainable, there's a simultaneous recognition that one third of the world's food waste food is thrown away. And that's equivalent to over 3 billion tons of CO2 emissions. It's also a major source of methane emissions, which has 80 times the warming power of CO2e in the short term. This increased conscious, next slide please, extends beyond food waste to the food that we eat. So we found in our data that almost half of people predict that red meat will be seen as equally as harmful to using fossil fuels by 2030. And this is particularly profound in the UK. So two thirds of UK consumers say that by 2030, they will not buy products that have a negative environmental impact or are single use. And people are putting their money behind their beliefs. So 50% of growth in consumer packaged goods from 2013 to 2018 came from sustainable products. Next slide, please. A trend we see across many brands from Burt's Bees, Nicola Vulture to the Impossible Whopper. Um, I found that quite interesting as a, as a long-term vegetarian. Burger King made a very bold and commercially savvy move when they entered the market for plant-based alternatives. They were very early to do that. Um, brand growth is something we've seen with companies like IKEA, um, who, as I talked about earlier, they continue to thrive with this approach. Um, sustainable product sales have grown 20% since 2014, whilst conventional product sales have dropped. These are all average figures and stats on this slide. Unilever reports sustainable brands growing faster, 69% faster than the rest of the business. And Clorox says that of their sustainable brands, um, Burt's Bees is growing seven times faster than normal product lines. And I think we've heard um, across the board as well that vegan lines are the fastest growing product in UK supermarkets. 91% of millennials will switch to a new product from a purpose-driven company, even in the most loyal categories like cosmetics. This will cause people to switch. And our research shows that more startlingly, and I found this the most interesting data point, 64% of people will choose, switch, or boycott a brand based on its stand on societal issues. And actually, within that demographic, millennials will actually pick up the phone and call a company and ask them to take action. So this is the age of empowered and activist consumers, if consumers is today still the right word for this demographic. Next slide. These paradigm shifts in consumer behavior combined with changing attitudes and governments and investors and the acceleration in technology um, could signal the arrival of what John Elkington, the godfather of sustainability, often calls green swans. In the short, the consequences of the pandemic are overwhelmingly negative, but precisely because they are such a shock to the system, it is the time for us to fundamentally reassess the value, true value that we deliver for society and how we operate. And what does that mean for us as business leaders? Business and brands need to fundamentally rethink the true value they create for society. It's not good enough anymore for a business to claim to do good things. Consumers will no longer tolerate inauthenticity. 
And the social media that has connected them to causes has given them a voice and they are using it. So they call us out very quickly if we're not being authentic. We saw that in the wake of the pandemic um, with brands and businesses reaching into our homes um, and trying to understand if we're okay. And it's not good enough to do good things that are slightly removed from your business model. Again, that just doesn't ring true. So the question becomes, what is the true value that you can create for society? We must go beyond what is popular to what is truly important. And it's a chance for business to lead the way and help affect real change. So how do you achieve that? And what does that mean for your corporate strategy or your brand strategy? So on this slide, you can actually see that this Venn diagram. Um, in advertising, in marketing, we've always been obsessed by consumer needs and brand equity. But what we all need to do now, every business leader, is to incorporate into our strategic thinking and strategic design this third externality of what the world needs. That needs to be incorporated into our thinking, into our design, and our innovation processes. And that's been historically quite challenging for organizations, particularly who are focused on the sustainable development agenda. The SDGs are easily translated for policymakers, but potentially less so if you're a consumer-facing brand. Um, and at Densi, we've translated these, this what the world needs into sustainable behaviors. The brands can influence and consumers can change. And these aren't rocket science. They are things like reduce, recycle, reuse, switch to plant-based, be energy smart, think durable, choose nature friendly. Those are all consumer behaviors that we have the ability to influence and change. This is within our gift. So we embed this into all of our design toolkits from creative to campaigns to customer experience and digital innovation. That means that every business we partner with has the opportunity to drive the right sustainable behavior. And this is critical because according to the Climate Change Commission, over 50% of the net zero transition is dependent upon human and societal behavior change. If you think about that, if we want to decarbonize automotive, we need people to switch to electric vehicles. We need them to fly less or fly differently. So it's all dependent on how we behave. The food system, if we want to scale it, for example, we need to think about how we make more choices, plant-based choices that are more sustainable or switch to forms of sustainable agriculture. This is our collective challenge. We need every business and business leader to lean in and start to look at things through this multi-dimensional lens. Next slide. Our aim is to close the intention to action gap. Today's consumer is more aware of social issues and they care more. 88% of consumers want brands to help them live sustainably. And Google Trends identified a 4,500% increase in searches for how to live a more sustainable lifestyle at this point than last year. That's a massive explosion in interest and a huge opportunity. But there is still a huge gap between intention and action. So 80 to 90% of people want to make that change, but only about 15 to 20% of people actually make a different decision at the till, at the till actually put that interest into action. We need to make sustainable lifestyles as aspirational as the American dream and really close that gap. And there, within that gap, that Nine, what is it, 80 to 15, there is a huge opportunity for innovation to do things differently, to find new spaces for growth. And all of our data tells us that consumers and customers will reward business and brands that help them to live more sustainably. So this can help to drive employee engagement. It can help build brand and reputation. It can help drive growth. So some final thoughts. The power balance has shifted. Consumers are no longer passive. Consumer attitudes have changed. We are prioritizing needs over once and open to a new way of living. Now is the time to capitalize upon that opportunity by being bold, by innovating and taking risks. Human-centric design drives innovation and growth. Sustainability drives loyalty and growth. So by factoring that third externality into your business, brand and product strategy, you can capture value not previously identified. And lastly, this is our collective challenge. It will require new thinking, new approaches, but most of all, a new type of leader, one that understands the interconnected and holistic nature of the challenges we face. And that is up to all of us. But where to begin? So Alan, I'm going to hand over to you now to talk about how we make this real. 
Okay, thank you. So the ask of me is to sort of share some of my thoughts uh, through the various companies I've worked for, from B&Q right up to Drax now. So about five or six different global companies. And rather than give case studies, what I was just going to quickly highlight is a sort of my top line thinking. Um, and when I look at all these issues we've heard being described today and you're listening to at this festival, is you can very quickly get overwhelmed by a lot of concepts. They're all vitally important, sustainable development goals, systems change. And what you're thinking is, well, well, how do I do this um, in my business? And I sometimes use a, a manufacturer of brass door handles. How do these concepts apply to something as straightforward as a brass door handle? And what I do in a, in, a, in a longer version of this lecture is sort of unpack that into five questions which I think any business leader and any business can ask of themselves. And so it's about creating a story and a narrative around sustainable development, which is relevant to you. Turning these massive concepts and big challenges into something which you can talk about in your company. And so there are five very simple questions. And if I was doing the longer version, I would unpack these in a bit more detail. The first one is, in your own words, what is the problem sustainable development is trying to solve? And here what I'm doing is saying, listen to the commentary you hear from the experts. Uh, use that, but create a language and a narrative which you are comfortable with and you feel is relevant to your particular company. A company which is making food will put more emphasis on health and, and, and food, obviously. A company, perhaps in aviation, will talk more about carbon. So it's really important that you create a narrative which you feel like you own. And this really talks about the guts of sustainable development. And by this, I mean, what's my narrative? How would I answer that particular question? What I say is, it's actually a very simple concept. It's about eliminating poverty and hardship around the world by creating quality lives for people. And the means we do that is through trade. And so in, in an example on the brass door handle, you can see brass door handles are made in India. So they're creating incomes in India. They're creating a very simple, straightforward product, which helps you have a better quality of life. And that through that, you create uh, you know, trade income, which funds the changes you need in, in, in society to get people out of poverty. However, the numbers don't add up. If everybody had the lifestyle illustrated in this photograph, you would need three planets worth of natural resources. That means it's a supply chain challenge. And most companies talk about their supply chain. And so by this, I'm pulling the language into the day-to-day -day use of the, the language a, a company will use in their day-to-day -day stuff. Sustainable development is a supply chain challenge. We don't have enough stuff to create the demand we have for 9 billion quality lives, 7 billion today, 9 billion in the future. And as we say, John, uh, it's already been mentioned by Tony, population is growth growing. This is a very interesting graph because at one level, you just talk about it through the lens of population growth because that's what it is. But if you look at that through the lens of sales growth for a company, there's not a single company in the world which has managed that level of sales increase that late in its development, especially wasn't when it wasn't expected. So what we're asking of the planet is something a business has never achieved, which is to accommodate that growth in demand. How are we going to do that? It's going to be innovation. So my challenge was, what's your narrative on sustainable development? How would you describe it with your leadership and with your colleagues? I say through the lens of a business person, it's about quality lives for 9 billion people with no unintended consequences. The unintended consequences, of course, being climate change, the loss of nature. These weren't deliberate interventions by business. Business's quest was quality lives but there were these unintended consequences. So what do we need to do to change our business to be true to that? So this takes me up to my second question, which is how would you frame sustainable development around the people you are serving? 
how do you make this relevant to their people everybody has slightly different customers so again think of your customers how is this relevant for them and then the third one which tends to be the most emotive and the most and creates the most provocation which is if your products could talk what would they say if you asked your products these questions what would their answer be where are they making people's lives better today and where are they making people's lives worse today and again the glass door handle is a really interesting example at one level you say a brass door handle couldn't be more benign tony couldn't get into his nice wooden office if he didn't have a door handle um, so it's a useful product but when you go up the supply chain and you see how they're made um, it's a different question this 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 photograph is from india and you can see the working conditions in a factory now this was 1990s i was working for b and q and this was an actual picture of a b and q factory then making brass door handles so suddenly all those health issues tony was talking about you know suddenly become very real and so if this brass door handle was giving this lecture about sustainable development and talking about its its life at one level it would say i'm brass i'm easy to recycle i have a very benign impact on people's lives and the Ashley, you need me to open and shut doors. But if you go out the supply chain, it's a story of poverty, exploitation, health and safety. This just illustrates the point a bit further. Look at the health and safety there, molten brass with no protection at all on that person's foot. So this is, these are accidents and health issues waiting to happen. A garden bench what's you know a garden bench in a garden is benign go up the supply chain and the story can be rainforest destruction so again the product story talk about sustainable development through the life cycle of the products people talk a lot about life cycle analysis which is lots of number crunching i'm not against that but also think about the qualitative story the human story the real story don't rely on measuring everything sometimes the issues are more obvious and harder to measure so that takes me to my fourth question, which is what needs to change in your business? So how would you change that brass door handle story into something positive? How would you turn that forestry story into something positive? And, and this takes us to the solutions. And suddenly the solutions become straightforward. If you're being Q, you understand health and safety. You understand how to make a factory safer. So just apply your existing knowledge to improve the working conditions in that factory and that's what B&Q did thousands of people lives improved so that brass door handle had a story it could tell which made it a lot prouder the solution to the the timber issue was the creation of the forest stewardship council which is now you know a well-established tool to allow retailers and buyers of timber to, to select timber which only comes from well-managed forests and it's being applied not just in B&Q, but across the retail and sort of big brand sector. That involved a lot more collaboration um, and bringing people together to make it happen. But it happened, and we've made an incremental improvement in how forests are managed and how timber is traded around the world. And so sometimes different things need to change. Sometimes it's your product design. Sometimes it's your business processes. Sometimes it's your business model as a whole. And sometimes it's the rules and regulations which gain that. But, in, but you as a company do have influence to change all of this. I spent a while in the steel sector where they're lobbying very hard for the right policies to allow them to decarbonize. Because their fear at the moment is, yes, they can spend the money, but it will make them uncompetitive and therefore they won't succeed. So can you change the rules about how steel is made and traded around the world? And the answer is, yes, of course you can. But you, the steel sector, have to ask for it and so my last question is what's your most unique contribution towards sustainable development and what we're hearing here is a lot of big problems and what I was trying to illustrate <coughs> is that if you are a brass importer your most important contribution is improving the working lives of brass manufacturing if you are part of the timber and trade sector timber and pulp sector your most important contribution probably will be to have procurement policies which allow you to only buy timber from well-managed forests um, and 
influence your competitors to do the same. And so focus on your most unique contribution. And sometimes there's a bit of fun. Um, I use a moon boot metaphor. And here I'm saying, you know, the challenge to put a man on the moon, which is obviously now over 50 years old, at one level is overwhelming. But at another level, it really is quite straightforward because why did the moon project succeed? Is that project was broken down into different people making different contributions. 750,000 people worked on the moon, to, worked to put two men on the moon, but none of them understood the whole project. They all made a unique contribution. 750 people alone worked on making the boots and if you imagine if the boots didn't fit or if they didn't work there would have been a moon landing there wouldn't have been a moon landing and so as a, for a bit of fun i sort of unpacked this lecture and sort of asked the question what is your moon boot what is your you most you what is the contribution only you can make or the most significant contribution you can make into this massive project, which is called Nine Billion Sustainable Lives by 2050. You can't do everything, but there are some things only you can do. Only people in the brass supply chain can improve brass, and it's thousands of people in India. Only people in the forestry and pulp supply chain can improve forestry. So really think about this most important contribution. So sort of pull this all together, here are my five questions. How would you describe sustainable development? So that if you have your own narrative, your own script, you, you'll be able to describe it more carefully. How do you think that impacts on the lives of people? What was the sustainable lifestyle you think they want? But put the emphasis around your products and your services. Think about sustainable development through your product. As a metaphor, think of your product giving a lecture on its contribution towards sustainable development what would make you proud and what would make you embarrassed and perhaps most importantly what don't you know if you don't know you don't care yeah. knowing what's good knowing what's bad what do you need to change is it your product design is it your supply chain is it the laws or is it your finally your business model and through that you automatically answer which i think is the most important question which is the theme of this talk what is your most important contribution? And if you want a bit of fun to explain what we mean, ask yourself the question, what is your moon boot? Thank you. Thank Back you. To you Thank you very much indeed, um, Alan, Anna, and, and Tony for sharing those incredible insights and for tackling the impossible mission of mm. condensing what we usually spend a long time uh, ruminating over into uh, 12 minute slots. So I'm now going to open to questions. I've been tracking some questions coming through uh, on the chat. So please do pose any questions there, but perhaps I shall just kick off with a question for Anna, uh, which relates to a question I've seen come through on the chat. And I guess so um, technology is undoubtedly going to be part of the solution in the same way that enabling consumers to access good information has, in, has helped them make more informed decisions. But there is a concern that this will further exacerbate inequalities for the, for the population of people. I don't know how many it is, 40 percent or so without access to the basics such as Internet. And this was um, reflected in the chat uh, with someone odd asking around changing consumerism and whether this is based uh, in terms of what you presented globally uh, or on the Western world conversation specifically. Can I really mute? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alice. That's a really great, great question. I mean, um, for a very long time, I was very much focused on digital inclusion as one of the um, essential enablers of the sustainable development agenda. Um, technology is absolutely part of the solution. We talk about the business opportunity associated with purely digital solutions and sustainability being valued at about $11 trillion by 2030. It's a huge growth opportunity in almost every sector. And net zero will be the biggest driver of innovation. It will be the biggest driver of technological innovation. Um, but of course, we talk about the just transition and what about those who are left behind? Uh, at Densu, you know, one of a third of our business is media. So we work um, with governments, we work with NGOs like Greenpeace and you know WWF. We work with big brands, trying to reach people 
all over the world, um, in every market, in every community, um, with the messages, you know, whether that's about um, getting tested for breast cancer, getting screened for breast cancer, or buying, you know, a new type of Coca-Cola. And um, what we've learned through that is that you can reach almost everybody. Uh, so people who may not have access to the internet by the same forms that we may consider, for example, laptops, uh, potentially have mobile phones. Um, you know, in India, you know, mobile phone penetration is very, very high. Um, we recently launched a, a platform for malaria, a global campaign for malaria, um, because our target market was sub-Saharan Africa, specifically 10 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we designed that um, on a Facebook platform because actually Facebook is, is a huge channel in Africa. So I don't think digital inclusion is, is quite the barrier that it once was. Um, skills, of course, are. Um, and um, but if you if you're trying to reach people um, with messages, if you're trying to give them tools and technologies that they can use to make best choices, um, then it's it's certainly more accessible than it was. Um, an example: we ran a campaign in Taiwan, uh, the Taiwanese Fish Checker with National Geographic, where we equipped people with an app. Um, that they could download to be able to scan fish in the markets to check whether it was from sustainable sources before they bought it. That's got very, very high penetration in Taiwan. So I think um, we've we've seen a huge acceleration in the adoption of technology, which which is an enabler now. Thanks very much indeed, Anna. Some really fascinating insights from the inside of a pretty significant sector, I'm sure everyone will agree. So next I'm going to uh, go back to, to Tony. So so Tony, over, over your many years, I guess, in, in your career talking on behalf of the natural world, you spend a lot of time looking at very difficult to digest facts, and you've been doing so for a long time. Um, and I'm really delighted to see that in the, in the live discussion, the participants are really engaged in kind of the systems mindset and the connections that we're making and, and really asking the big questions around, okay, what's your take on the gap between where we are and need to be recognizing you have been talking about this scientific basis for action for a long time. And if you could perhaps lay a thin veneer of something related to COP over the top of that, that would help keep it relevant to the conversation. Thank you. Um, yeah, the gap between where we are and, and where we need to be um, is it, it, still pretty big, um, but it's a bit smaller than it was a few years ago. And I would think, I would say the, um, the, the, the biggest progress we've made during recent times is closing that conceptual gap that we've mentioned a few times on this discussion today uh, between economy and environment, as it were. Uh, you know, we, we've had this prevailing uh, view, more or less implicit, sometimes quite explicit, that the destruction of the environment actually is the price of progress and it's regrettable but it's inevitable and therefore we have to tolerate extinction deforestation pollution uh, in order to be able to to have economic growth and it's only quite recently that we've broken through that to the point now where there is this much more um, joined up view including in many boardrooms and certainly in many governments whereby there is an understanding that the economy actually is a wholly owned subsidiary of nature and not the other way around and it's hard to overestimate the importance of that because that's been the main battle that we've been having for the last 30 years and i've been involved with all of this uh, whereby it's been hard to even make uh, the case for nature protection, never mind nature recovery, because it was seen as something which was subsi subsidiary uh, to the, the process of economic development. So we are beginning to get through that, and you can see that in policy in this country and some others, whereby there is this understanding that the two things need to be done together. And actually, the big prize, and this is now visible in some of the things going on here in, in England at least, is the extent to which we're now moving beyond protecting remnants and last populations of rare animals and plants and we're moving into a period of nature recovery and, and if you look at the the value we get from healthy nature in protecting public health and well-being catching carbon purifying rivers helping us adapt to climate change then you quickly reach the conclusion that we don't have enough nature so we need to repair it not just hang on to what's left and that is just beginning so the the, the gap uh, that was 
pretty huge. It's still huge, but it's smaller. And we're now moving into this new period where we now have to line up uh, the different tools that we've got behind nature recovery rather than simply protecting the last little bits that are left. And that's beginning to occur. And it's about integrating different policies. And of course, as we've said a few times today, it's about having a different economic idea uh, and how we're going to regrow and rebuild na nature and natural health at the same time as meeting human needs. And uh, at least if you ask the question, you might get some better answers. And we weren't even asking the question until recently. When it comes to the COPs and, and what's going to be going on uh, with these global discussions over the coming period, uh, well, one thing I, I would say uh, is that we need to be finding a read across between COP26 that Britain will be hosting and COP15 that China is hosting uh, on biodiversity. Uh, and, you know, there is a parallel global process going on uh, through the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is getting very little airtime compared with the obsession with COP26. And, you know, as those pictures I showed you of the Amazon reveal very graphically, these two things are one and the same. They are two sides of the same coin. And this COP process... Uh, looking at that big question of climate change, one of the things that needs to occur is to have a strong alignment with the parallel processes going on on biodiversity and for both of them to have a very strong economic dimension, I would say, Alice. Thank you very much indeed, Tony. And I guess if you've been shining a light on it for so long, um, it's, it's reassuring yet somewhat still frustrating that things are moving, but not at the pace and, and scale that we require to really shift the dial from that incremental change to something more substantial. Uh, so we've only got a few minutes left and I'd really love to share a final slide. But before I do so, I will um, just ask a final question of Alan. So Alan, under the under pressure, under uh, like two minutes to respond. So we've so for so long talked about reconciling profitability within business with sustainability and now that we've kind of tightened every bolt mm. and unscrewed and replaced every light bulb within the business do you agree that we're now at the stage where we're having to have that frank conversation about okay you can't do this alone as a business there are going to be some effects in quite significant commercial ways to your bottom line and there was a great question popped in from dan in the chat around sectors needing to collaborate and shift together so just the, the question of the challenge and opportunity of effective collaboration. Well, I think, yes. I mean, the FSC model is was a huge collaboration and still is. Uh, I was, when I was working in the steel sector, there was a collaboration called Responsible Steel. There was also a collaboration on responsible mining. So the, these collaborations do exist. At the moment, they focus on standards. What does good look like? And how do we prove those standards exist? But at some stage, the collaborations have also got to go, go beyond the sector. How do you how do you collaborate across the whole value chain? How do you bring different sectors together? And I currently, I work for Drax, the power station, which is involved in carbon capture and storage uh, and biomass. And now we're working in the whole Yorkshire Humberside region as sort of as a community of businesses to make that whole business model work. So yes, absolutely, collaboration is, is essential. Um, but collaboration with a purpose is better. And that's why I think the FSC and the Responsible Steel models got traction, because they were working together to create something, which in that case was a standard, which we would then promise to adhere to, which takes it aside from a collaboration with just a think tank who writes a report. So yes to collaboration, but they work when they have a distinct purpose. Um, and there's plenty of examples out there where that's happened and succeeded. And thank you, Alan. Thank you very much indeed. And it was just this morning I saw a quote, and it's an African proverb saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I know the hashtag for this, for this festival is um, faster together. So I suggest we need to go both fast and far. And um, I think I've just got one final slide to leave you with. I've only got a minute to do so. So if you wouldn't mind sharing my slide, that would be much appreciated. If not, I'm sure I can just talk. Okay, so yes. So um, the... The program, as I said, is 27 years old, the Prince of Wales Business Sustainability Program. I just wanted to highlight, I dug around in the archives, the significant difference in conversation that we've been having with delegates over the last kind of 20 odd years. So the conversation in 1997 from the report was a question, should business accept leadership on this role thrust onto it in terms of sustainability? And delegates were all but unanimous in rejecting that high profile leadership group. And I think generally the consensus was, okay, government will sort it out. 
The difference today is quite significant. Just a couple of uh, um, testimonials from the feedback on our programs from Big Wealth Manager and the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. And I just uh, focus in on the fact that business as usual is a thing of the past. Leaders have a huge opportunity and responsibility is the important world there to act. So we have come a long way in our narrative over the years. I suggest, as I've mentioned, we do need to move faster uh, together in, in making sure that the next time I quote something in the 2030s and 40s, we're almost obsolete in saying sustainability is important to business and that we need to shift quickly. So thank you very much indeed to everyone for joining us. Thank you again to Business Green for putting on this incredible festival and wishing you all the best for the weekend. Cheers. Thanks, Alice. Thank Thanks, Alice. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.